А сейчас мы приглашаем на сцену следующего нашего докладчика, который приехал к нам специально из Бразилии. Это Филиппе Насемьента де Маура, Google Developer Expert по веб-технологиям из Порта Алегри, Бразилия. Филиппе работает разработчиком более 12 лет, является соорганизатором большой конференции Бразил JavaScript по тематике JavaScript конференция, которая проходит каждый год и собирает более полутора тысяч участников. Доклад будет на английском, и у вас есть шанс улучшить свои знания английского языка. Thank you. First of all, thank you all for being here. I know it's early and thank for the, all the organization. It's an amazing venue, an amazing conference. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So, thank you. Let's talk a little bit about progressive web apps. And I think it's uh, a good moment for us to talk about that. I am Felipe, and here's a little bit about me. I worked like a little bit longer than 12 years with web technologies. I am in love with JavaScript. I am a Google developer expert on web technologies. And I also am the co-founder of Brazil.js and NASC. So this is Brazil.js, our logo, the conference in Brazil. And this is NASC, my company. And I came from there. It's a little bit far away. And also, I came from actually there from the stream south of Brazil. So it's a little bit colder than the rest of Brazil and stuff. But now let's talk about nerdy things. Uh, about uh, the, these new technologies we have been seeing lately, uh, they, are bring, they are enabling us to use the, the, all the features to create better progressive web apps, and that's awesome. So the main ones are like, it's based on open web technologies, so it's open. We are, doing, we are not going to have to worry about some company going there and saying, now you have to pay to use that. We have seen that before, right? And it's based on service workers. Service workers is a very complicated new technology. It's awesome, it's very nice, but it's not as easy as I would like it to be. And we also have the manifest. Manifest is quite simple. But we also have some good practices to follow, all right? So if you want to have a good web app, you should be thinking on all these good practices. Like for example, your web app should have a very nice responsive design. This way, um, you, your user is going to have a nice experience anywhere he is trying to access your web app. That's very impressive, very important. And also, it doesn't matter if you have a web app that is a bad web app, and then you make it like a progressive web app working offline. Then you have a offline bad web app. So that, that's not worth it. So you have always to think on maybe like your animations. Animations are awesome. I love animations, but your animations, they need to, be, to make sense, you know. Your animations, if sometimes we add too many animations, and they just don't make sense. And other times, an animation can help the user to understand what's going on. So you have to know how to deal with them. And the accessibility is also very important. So like uh, your tools, your features should be accessible to everyone. Everyone should be able to at least get a glimpse of what your app is trying to do. Let's talk a little bit longer about service workers. As service workers are, service workers are a bit more complex. So. Uh, for example, what the, have you heard? Who here have heard of service workers? Yeah, okay, yeah, quite a few actually. And so service workers, was uh, they are going to allow us to redirect pages, for example. Re we can redirect actually any request. So the user is going for one request and you can like act that, interact with that and change it. We can also intercept requests so we can uh, deal with anything that's going out from the user. And for example, I, I was looking for a nice image to, to talk about intercepting requests, and this was the funniest I could found. So it was almost, and the, we can now actually intercept what's going on in the browser. It's the first time you can do that using JavaScript. There are many interesting things happening here, like there is this guy here, he's saying hi to someone in the air. Many interesting things in this figure. 
and also we have the cache control. We can now control our cache in a much better way. So sometimes if you don't have cache control, you have a lot of processing going on, going on on your server, or you have a lot of money going out due to the bandwidth, and then you can use cache. But sometimes you even have too many things on your cache, and that might also be a problem. So you have to know how to manage that. And also version control. This time we can now actually have a better version control of our web app. So when we had the app cache, app cache was a technology that was here for a few years ago, and it was very ugly, it was very unsuccessful. And web, uh, the, the app cache intended to do that, but this was one of the, the main problems. So now we have a much better version control of it. You can know exactly the, uh, which version your user is accessing of your web app. And also it's uh, very progressive. That's uh, something very important. Uh, during the evolution of JavaScript, they were trying to add some new features, and one of them was the array.has. To know if an array had an element inside of it. And when, when they were doing that, they realized that millions of websites were using out there a library that applies that array.has method in a different syntax. So if they had added that feature to the browsers, millions of websites would simply broken from line to one night to the other. So they have this, this feeling like, we cannot break the web. Sometimes you can just add a small thing and then you are going to break half the web. So they are always worried about that and progressive evolution is the way you can do that. So we are going to progressively adopt and evolve the web and JavaScript has done that very well. So progressive is one of the main words we have here. And how we are going to do that? We are going to do that based on web technologies, open source technologies, so we are not afraid of any patent, any rights, you know. It's fully asynchronous, so everything you are going to see there is asynchronous, what is awesome in JavaScript. Oops. And it's safe, it's, uh, it requires HTTPS, or localhost for your development. So we are going, we are walking in the uh, direction like most companies want the whole web as HTTPS. I don't know how possible that is, but they want all the pages to run on HTTPS. So we have even free tools to make it happen. And that's the web, right? It's safe, it's faster, it's open, it's web technology. So that's the, the web itself. And why, why do, why are they working on that, on, on, on web service workers, etc.? So, like, so this way we can have support in many different platforms. Service workers are now supported on Firefox, Opera, and Chrome, and Safari. Uh, Apple announced that they are already working on that, so soon it's going to be supported also on Safari. So it's going to be everywhere. Uh, this works on slow connections. That's a real problem in Brazil, for example. And also, even when you are offline, that's also a very important feature for, for us here. And it's installable on the user's device. It's actually installable, so you can have the web page installed in the user's device. The user is going to have it. The user will be able to search through the other the, the apps installed on the device, and also to to see that on the screen, etc. It, it works just like an app. And it's much, much faster. We have techniques to make it work really, really faster. And that's the definition of app. And as you might know, web developers are very good at naming things. So the name of it is Progressive Web App. So it's very, it was actually easy to, to name it. And I don't know, you can see that? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, that's bad, yeah. So that's the symbol we see when we are offline and when we are like, oh my God, what, what am I gonna do? And uh, this is the offline symbol of problem, right? So when you, the user sees that, the user is in trouble and all the user can do is like this. All right, that's all the user can do. Uh, sometimes I get home and I am walking down the, the corridor and I listen to the and I think, oh my God, the internet is off because my neighbor is playing it. So that's what the user can do. But this is even worse, all right? This is much worse. This is when your cell phone is lying to you. So this is the live file. Your cell phone is lying to you. Yes, I have internet, go ahead. And then you go and all you see is that. 
and you see the the symbol there that's loading and you think oh my god if i leave now i'm sure in two seconds it would load then you wait two seconds and no maybe five more seconds and it's much much worse for the user it's a terrible user experience but again your progressive web apps must make sense it doesn't matter if you add all the features i'm going to show you here today and then when the user is offline you show a message telling him you are offline that is as useful as this right so let him at least play a little bit maybe that's even better and this is a nice chart this is a chart I searched on YouTube for how to destroy your cell phone. And there are 4 million videos teaching you how to destroy your cell phone. So just to make that, 4 million cell phones were destroyed. Just to make that. And each one have, have a couple million views too. So that's why people are frustrated. This is what has happened today. <laughs> so you have your basic needs like food, water, safety. You have to feel well with yourself and all of this can be accomplished with the internet okay you need food okay get yourself on and ask food you need help you need whatever you need to feel better with yourself call your mother so you always have the internet beside you let's talk about the manifest manifest is quite easy to do it's quite simple and it was uh, it is an evolution because who here has uh, heard of firefox os yeah yeah well actually it's very well known here Firefox OS was a try uh, from well, Mozilla, of course. They were trying to create a Firefox OS version for uh, simpler devices. And they started with this idea of the manifest, so you could be able to install your page in that cell phone. So the first version of it uh, unfortunately died. The project was killed. But we have now the new manifest. And this is an evolution. It's actually very good and very simple. In your HTML page, like in your index page, you are going to say the link rel manifest and say what's the, the file in your root path. So there is my file. Also, I have a couple meta tags there that we're, uh, they are going to help the user to interact with our progressive web app. After that, I can create the JSON file. So here I am targeting it, and here is the content of that file. It's a basic JSON saying like the source for my images, the background color, them color, where my web app starts, things like that. It's very, very easy, very straightforward. And this is the result. Like we had this progressive web app for Brazil.js, and then when you install it in your cell phone, you can see that there as if it was an app. And also when you open it, you can see the colors in the background and also in the, in the bar on top of that, the task bar. That was all this, uh, defined on my manifest. That's the effect my manifest has on the web app. And service workers, now it's a little bit complicated, more complicated. Let's code. But first we have to talk about a little bit about theory. And I know, yeah, theory is boring, I know. But uh, as this, phrase, this statement says, theory is the difference between knowing and knowing. You know, that's a very smart uh, sentence from a very smart guy, me, I just invented it. And we have to go through it. So service workers have their own scope. What that means? That means they only work on their domain, their port. And this is actually there to ensure our security, all right? And once registered, they, they run in background. Uh, if you are using Windows, for example, you can see it in the, the tray bar there. Sometimes your browser is fully closed. And even though you see the small icon of the browser running there, that's because you have service workers like listening there. There is a process behind your, your device, behind your browser, that is working in background for your service worker. So it's not, uh, this is a, a tricky part because if you have like three tabs of your web page, all of those three tabs of the same page, they are running in a, one single service worker process. We don't have one process of your service worker in each tab. We have one running in background for all the three pages, okay? It's interesting because when you are working with, uh, with service workers, sometimes you add a debugger there. And then in one page, you have the console opened. It stops right there, okay, in your breakpoints. And then in the other tab, when you refresh it, it's, it never ends. That's because that first tab has, is holding your service worker stopped. So you are seeing the wrong tab 
but all the tabs are working in the same service worker and it stopped by now. Uh, also requires HTTPS, as I said, and, uh, or localhost, and can only deal with requests in its own scope. So it works with requests from your domain, port, etc. This is how it, uh, it works in its life cycle. It's an open image. You can find that in any documentation, so I'm going to be a little bit faster here. Uh, the idea is that you, when you open your, a page that's trying to re register a service worker, the first step is it, it's going to try to install itself, okay? And then you can actually, you can hold the installation. You have the event.wait until, so you can say like, before you install, wait until I do this, and then you use a promise. And when you finish doing that, then you allow it to finish the installation. The, we have the install, the, yeah, the installation, and then you have the installed. It, this is, happens when it's already installed. So from now on, like your service worker is registered, what do you want to do with that? And you also can work with that and also work with the, like, the previous service worker that was installed. Activating. Once your service worker was installed, it may not be activated yet. If the, us the user has one page opened running your service worker, you cannot simply replace it with a new version. Remember, all the tabs of the user are running the same service worker. If you do that, you might break that other tab that was already opened. So the engine is going to wait for that to be closed, and then it's going to be activated. You can force that by using the clients.clean. Okay, you can say, no, I want to run it right now. Or you can also wait until you do something, like clean the cache, things like that. Then it gets activated or redundant. Redundant is if it's already running. So for those who are still awake, we can now, we, now let's code for real. This is, this is not a lie this time. So I hope you like seeing code and I hope you can read that. Remember the word progressive. This is how we would do that. If the navigator has the word service worker, has it, this feature, then we are going to use that. Otherwise, okay, the user is going to, uh, the user is not going to be able to open that when offline, etc. but it's going to work just as fine. If the user has the service worker support in that browser, then we can register that. Is this, there is a, oh, cool then you can register that. And this is the file I want to, to use to register my service worker. And this is important. It must be in your root path. So this must be like in, the, in your slash folder, right? And it's a promise. Uh, are you familiar with promises here? Yeah? Because you are going to see a lot of promises here. Sometimes I feel like a Brazilian politician, you know, like lots of promises. So when, after you register that, then you can do something or say that there, there was a problem. It's quite, quite easy, right? It's actually, this is the easy part. This is in my index file, okay, in my HTML file. It's saying, okay, the user has reached this index file and now I want to register the service worker. Done, the index part is done. And this is another interesting thing. The browsers that cannot support service worker, they won't even know that. So for now, Safari can't support that, and that's okay. Safari users are just going to use your web app online, as they have been, have been doing lately. So now we are going to go to the SW file. This is the, you can name that as you want, and then you register that, all right? So this is the one I had registered before. And I, what I am going to do here is, I'm, in this scope, the service worker scope, I have this other, this special events I can listen to. And one of them is the install event. Just like I showed you in the theory, okay? So I'm installing it, and the event of installation is here. And I can say, okay, look, wait until I do something else. And this something else is a new promise in which I can like, I might fetch a lot of data, I might do, add this to, I don't know, my cache, anything and then I can resolve it. So it's waiting until I do that, then it says, okay, it's installed. And this is the other event, like, after installed, if my user has a different tab using my service worker, it's not going to be activated instantly. So when this gets activated, this is going to be triggered. 
an interesting thing we have done here is when you are installing, you cache everything you want to cache. When you get activated, you delete all the previous cache. Because if you do that here, the user might have a tab opened using that previous cache and you might break its tab. So this is how you can do that. You, you clean your old cache here. And this is another interesting feature. So in our dev tools, now you can see the tab application. And you can see now here the service worker with the service worker running. So you can go there and you can see that. And it's very nice because if you activate the show all and you, you work like me, like I have like 50 to 60 tabs opened every day in my web browser. And then it's funny because if you have many pages with the Facebook like button, you are going to see a list of Facebook here, like dozens of them. Because each iframe of those like buttons is running a service worker with Facebook. So you can see them all here. It's very interesting to see how many of them. This is the, I think this is the most important event we are going to deal with here. So this is the fetch event, and this is the interesting new feature here. Because anything that goes from your web page, anything is going to pass through this event. Even your index page. When the user hits, when the user types the URL and hits enter, this is going to pass through here. And you'll be warned about that. So you can deal with that. It's very interesting, very powerful. And what, I, what I'm doing here is very easy. Like, I have this URL, so I'm using the URL API to parse it. And then my event, this is the request itself, is going to respond with, I am going to fetch, so I'm going there, for the request itself. So I got the request, and I am fetching the request, and then I am answering it or treating it. What I'm doing here is absolutely useless. So it, it, it's for nothing, like the user is requesting something and I am requesting the same thing and giving it to him. So I'm just like, uh, I step away, uh, one step in front of him. And this is how I can treat that, like I'm doing nothing with it. Just any request that goes there passes through my service worker and I can, for example, log it, I can do whatever I want. But now I can do some interesting things, like I can get, uh, I have a const here saying what's my index file, okay, my new version, for example. And I can say that anything that matches the slash older folder, anything that the user goes there, like any image, any script, any HTML file, any CSS, anything, I am, they are going to match this regular expression. And then instead of just responding with the request itself, what I'm going to do is respond with the newer version. So when the user types the older version, I am actually delivering the new one. And this is, like, is totally fully JavaScript. So I can also treat 404 errors. This can be done using JavaScript purely. So how can I do that? Let me, the idea is like, I, again, I have my const saying the, the path for my 404 page, and I am parsing the URL, and then I am going to respond with go there and find what the user wants. Like, the user wants this request, I, I went there, and then if my response is 404, I am actually returning another promise. Remember? Lots of promises. So, this is going to wait for the, this promise to, to be responded, to be resolved, and then this promise, instead of resolving, it's returning another promise. So now, this is waiting for this. And then when this new fetch resolves, then the user gets the response. If it was not 404, then we respond with the response itself and that's okay, we're there. So now we can actually tweet the 404 error pages with JavaScript and we can have our own customized 404 pages. So these are two small little things that we couldn't do with JavaScript uh, like, I don't know, one year ago, a couple years ago, and now we can do that. Everyone in the same page here, yeah? If I'm going too fast, just let me know. So that's pretty cool. Oh, now it's time for a deep dive, so we are going to go much further into service workers. Get ready, get your thinking hats. And 
No? Yes? No? No? Oh, yeah. So, we are going to cache stuff here now. Have you heard of offline first? What we are going to, imp to implement here is the offline first strategy. There are three main strategies. They are the offline first. This is when the user asks for anything, let's say an image, instead of going to look for that image, you look in your cache, and if it's there, you give to the user. It's almost instantly. This is the offline first. The online first is go there, and if there is any problem, then you look in your cache. And there is also the fastest strategy, so you do both. You go both online and in your cache. Of, uh, of course, your cache is going to be much faster, then you are going to deliver the, the what's cached to the user, but when your online request gets back, you are going to update your cache. So the user is always one step behind. This is a way you can keep your user like kind of up to date and it should be fast enough for the user to have a nice experience. So what you are going to do here? Uh, I am listening to the install, okay? And when it's installed, uh, it's installing, I, I will say, okay, wait until I do something, and it, this is caches.open. Caches.open is a promise. And then when it's done, I, I, I receive the cache itself, and then I return another promise, the add all. So I'm going to open the cache, and then I will add the list of files I want to that cache, which is another promise. And now I can see all those caches in the application tab again. So I can see in the cache the V1. V1 is the name of the group I said. So I, I open that cache, and I can see that here now. So I can see both requests there. The whole re request is cached now. This is very useful for your app shell. The app shell is like the basic things your web app needs to work. And this is usually your main HTML file, your CSS, your basic JavaScript, and a couple of images, like your logo, stuff like that. This way you have like, the user goes there and the user sees this working instantly because it was already in the cache. And then you go for the content. The content, you may need to go online or, or maybe you may have something in cache too. But the app cache is the main area where the user is, is going to touch the icon and see almost instantly the, your whole app working for him. Even including the JavaScript, the basic JavaScript like clicking in buttons, things like that. Then this is how we use the offline strategy. Things are going to be a little bit scary at this point, but don't worry, we can survive that. So I'm listening for anything that's fetched in the page, okay? And I am, again, I have the 404 page and I have parsed the URL object. And I'm going to respond it with something, okay? Step by step. The first thing I'm going to do is caches.match the request. Okay, so I might respond that request with whatever is in cache. Okay, so if that is in cache, we are going to re return that instantly. If that's not, then we have, uh, we get the result, so this is how we actually return that. Or we go and fetch that. So if it was not in cache, okay, so this was in cache, return it. Otherwise, return another promise that gets that. So if it, this is something that was part of our app, app, of, of our app shell, like the CSS, the main CSS, it was already in cache and returns instantly. Otherwise, it is going to be fetched. But we can do, the, uh, we can do better. We can treat the fetch request, and then if it's 200, we do something else. Otherwise, we just return the response itself. And here, uh, actually, we always, always return the response, but the user gets the response instantly, and then we are also creating new promises. We are opening the cache, and you are storing that response in cache. We have to clone that because when you do that, the user is opening the response and it can only be opened once. So we have to clone the response. We, have, we now have two responses that are clone of each other. And this way, what are you doing here? If this is in cache, respond that. Otherwise, go fetch it and then put it in cache. Next time, it is going to be in cache. So that's how we are prog progressively working on that. So, for example, if you have a blog page, then next time your user access your, your blog, at least a few of your articles are going to be in cache. 
And also, if it is failed, if, not, if it's not 200, then we can actually look for the not found page in cache. Remember that we had already added it to our cache in our app shell. So I know it's there. If it is installed, I know it's there. I can just found it in cache. We also have IndexedDB. IndexedDB is ugly. I don't like IndexedDB, but IndexedDB is the only way that is asynchronous and we can store things and get things besides the cache API. We cannot use like local storage. Local storage is synchronous, so it's not allowed. And it's very ugly, but we have some special tools to deal with them. This is how we do that. Like we can import a script on top of our, of, of our service worker. And we may have some helpers and IndexedDB abstraction, for example. So we, we may promise you find the IndexedDB. Web notifications is also very nice. So you can show notifications to your user. This is very easy. So like you are going to request the permission, then the, the small balloon appears, the user says yes or no, and then you go ahead. And to show the notification, all you do is that. Like it's very straightforward. You have to just ins you know, instantiate the new notification and then it appears. It's very simple. Now you have to add that to your manifest to inform that your web app is going to use the, uh, a push notification service. And then in your index file, again, you have to tell your registered service worker that you are going to use that. So that's how you get the service worker registration object and say, my push manager must subscribe. And now you are listening to post notifications, okay? And then this event is triggered. So if you go like, for example, in your Firebase and send a push notification, your service worker event is going to be triggered even if your browser is uh, closed. Even if your user is not using your page right now, this is going to work in background and this is going to be triggered. And now you can say like, okay, get the registration and show a notification with this content. This way we can show notification even offline. Even offline, even if the, your user is not using the currently the web browser. Some hard times to keep you saving time. Uh, turn on, oh, I forgot to translate that. Turn on, turn on the disable cache tool. So this way you are not going to fall in any trap. Sometimes you think you are caching things and then it's actually your browser that's caching things for you. So this is a, a nice way for you to develop. Clear storage is very interesting too. So this is a way you can clear everything, all the cache, all the indexed B, everything. This is very interesting for you if you are developing and maybe you have done something that was wrong, you can come here, clean everything and go ahead again. Show all again, as I said, you can see like all the, if you simply in, in Chrome, if you simply open a new clean tab, it has a service worker. So you can see them all here and you can actually focus them and update or register from them. You can clean this all. Work offline, this is interesting. When you are working on your service worker, then you think, okay, I'm done now. You can go here, click on offline and refresh your page. You're supposed to see at least your app shell, at least that, and it's instantly. So this means you have done a good work. But even better than that, you can go here in network and then throttling and you can simulate your, your speed. So this is even better. You can like simulate 2G, for example. And this way you are going to experience what the user is seeing. So if you have done your work well, when the user opens your page on a 2G, it's going to load instantly. Okay, it's going to be really, really fast because it was all in cache. Your app shell was all in cache. Maybe the article of your blog is going to load and take time, but your app, uh, your app shell it was fully cached, okay? Your app shell was already stored. Uh, this, this is the, actually this was the previous version of Lighthouse. Lighthouse is a Google's tool. So now you can install it on your browser and also run it in your CLI client terminal. And this is very nice. This gives you some, some grades on many different subjects. And so you can have a better idea of how good your web app is for the experience of your user. It's actually very hard to get a, a hundred there, very hard. Some tools you can use, like the uh, SW Precache is a very simple tool Google has launched. This is a tool that 
pre-caches everything and prepares you for the app shell. So your app shell is there and it's very easy to use. Okay, it's not using like the offline first strategy for everything, but your, your app shell is there. Workbox, this is the new project Google has launched. It's a very huge project. Okay, it's much more complicated. It's like a framework for service workers, but it's very nice, very powerful again. And you can use that to work uh, with different, many different situations of requests. And also, we have in Brazil this project. This is called the DSW. This allows you to create in a JSON file all the rules you want. So you can say like, oh, I, anything that matches this regular expression, I want to send to this and cache and store in IndexedDB. Just in a JSON file and this will, is going to create your service worker for you. It's a good, ni uh, nice way to start using service workers too. And thank you very much. Th these are my data, so if you want to get in touch, send me, ping me on Twitter or anything, and I will be glad to answer. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, please raise your hand. If you don't want to speak in English, please speak in Russian. I'll translate all questions. I will translate all questions if they will be in Russian. Perfect. Can you tell uh, about the future of uh, PWA? Uh, can it uh, replace native application uh, for mobile or desktop? Maybe. Th that's a, that's a uh, tough question. And I think uh, the idea is that any page may become a web app. Any page that if you have a tool that works online, then you can have that working as a progressive web app. Okay? And that's interesting because many companies have like a whole team to work for Android another team to work for iOS, another team to work for web. And now you can have only the team for the web and it's going to work for everybody, you know. So for about market, this is much more interesting, much more attractive. But for technology, this is like, there is a long way for it to walk and Android is also improving many things like the instant apps and things like that. So I, I don't think this is there to replace the native web, the native apps. But this is for sure a very nice option. And also we have many, many more web developers than we have like app developers. So it's interesting like to see, we are going to open doors for many, many people to create their first app for users. And also the one that wins the most is the user himself because the user is going to be able to install it and it's going to be much easier for them. We have many charts that show that user, users usually install one app a month in, in average. So like, when was the f last time you installed two apps like in a row? It's really hard to happen. And many, many times we install an app, use that, and then uninstall it. So this is uh, a way you can do that. Like, for example, Twitter. Twitter is now, there is a Twitter Lite, which is a progressive web app, and it's like one megabyte. And it's much, much smaller, and it works exactly the same. So it's, you look at and it's exactly the same face, the same actions, everything is exactly the same as the app. So we are still experimenting on that, okay? So uh, this technology is there for us to try it and to find out what else we can do with that. Uh, thanks. I hope I have answered. <laughs> thanks. Hello, my name is Sergey. I have a question. Uh, Usually when I programming, I prefer use file state machine like uh, pattern flux, you know? The patterns for? Uh, flux. Oh, flux. Fox. Yeah, yeah yes. that's interesting because you can actually work with whatever you want. You have freedom to do that. Uh, I work with uh, React Native. I programming, um, uh, programming app for Android and iOS Na native. Oh, you work with native? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. It, oh. React Native, oh, you know, React -native. Facebook oh, yeah. React Native, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, this progressive app can uh, support uh, Redux. Yeah, actually, uh, if you have your tool running online, you have a page, a web page that runs your tool, then that may become a progressive web app, and the user will be able to install that. Okay. You may also have your React Native version. You can use Ionic or any other tools, and you can create your native app. And then you can even like add to the store, for example, Play Store or iOS. And that's not a problem. Uh, the thing is that your web page may also be installed from now. And I think with 
with a little time, user will be more used to go there and install your, from your web page. So I think we are going to see the flow, like users use to install more your apps and access uh, just a few times your website. And I think they are going to open your website much more, much many times more. And uh, the use of the native app might reduce because of the, the weight of it, things like that. We have seen many companies out there that they have said that like the online visitation were like 70% bigger than before after they added the, the, these features. Oh, it's cool, thank you. And also I have second questions. Uh, you know what is big company now use progressive app, maybe Instagram or Uber? Yeah, Uber is already using it, so you have the Uber option to use that on your own as a progressive web app. Twitter is also using that. We have many other companies that use that for selling, like I don't remember the names now, but uh, I have a, another presentation that is, is full of examples like that because they have some online selling tools and then you can go there, you can at least see the products. You cannot buy them if you are offline, but you can at least see them, see the description, their pictures. It's very nice and many, many companies have said that they have accomplished a much better result thanks to that. Thanks to, and also it's much faster. Just the speed uh, already makes your user want to go there again. You know? So this is very, this is a new thing that we are finding out new results too. Oh, it's very cool. Thank you so for Thank your you. answer. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for a very brilliant presentation. <laughs> and uh, I want to ask you about, uh, has it any demands on uh, JS Engine? For example, uh, uh, will it support uh, on uh, JavaScript uh, expression in Comoel or Rhino? Yeah, the new versions, the new updates of the language, the new features for JavaScript. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. That's the, why they have the progressive word in the name. The idea is like to be really progressive and do not break the web. So any new feature is going to be very well planned, very well thought, uh, thought. And yes, all the new APIs are here to help actually the progressive web apps too. And also we, we were watching a, a presentation from Google and they showed a slide with like, I don't know, 40, 50 new APIs and they were all there helping progressive web apps to work and do more stuff. So like in a few years, a few years ago, we wouldn't be able to do most of the things we can do now. Like uh, we can uh, access the device light, you can assess the orientation, anything. And then that's, these are some of the new APIs that got into the technology and service workers and also all the other technologies related to progressive web apps. They are here to interact with this new stuff and they are all being planned to do that in the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to help you, uh, Felipe, for the inter interesting presentation. Thank you. And I would like to ask you about some features of uh, service workers. As I understand, this technology allows me, uh, as a simple user, to download the content, what I want to read or watch and uh, to see it later. Is, uh, is, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, can it happen that I uh, won't, uh, wouldn't fully download the application and I would see uh, only for zero four pages? Or yeah. I don't know if I got the, the problem. You can, you can actually download the whole application, yes. You can like store everything in cache depends on the size of your application of course you do want to store like one gigabyte in your user's cell phone but yes you can download all the css javascript html you need to store it in cache and maybe even images you can start the for example all the icons your font icons to also so your font families you can start all that in your cache and then you are going to request only like I need, the user needs to save something. Then you have to request that, okay? But even though, even that you can, if the user wants to save something, you can save that using index.db and try to save it online. If the user is offline, that's okay. You already saved that in index.db. So when you get online, you, you look, oh, I have this thing here in my index.db that I should save. And then you save that. So this way the user is going to be able to even save stuff in his machine 
and then when synchronized again with the web, the user will be able to, to post it. I don't know if that was your question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? And also, uh, can, uh, does uh, this uh, technology, uh, uh, is it able to uh, update cached uh, information without uh, users' activity in background when uh, the internet would be better? Yeah, uh, this, this is fully asynchronous, so this is always background. That's why it's a worker. It's like another, another thread, okay? And yes, you can actually manage the, the cache for the user, but only the cache related to your scope, all right? So like your domain and ports. And, but yes, you can, for example, you can look for everything that you have in cache, and then you can delete what's old, for example. You can update, you can add more things. This is the cache API, and you can do a lot of stuff with that. It's very useful, very simple to use, full of promises too. And you can manage that. And also, once you added something to your cache, it's there forever. Kind of forever, but it's there. The only way to remove it there is if you want to go there and remove it, or if the user goes there and clean it. But also, if the operational system notices that it needs space for the user to work with the machine, it's going to clean up some cache and then you have no power to deal with that. But you can store a lot of things there. And this is like your responsibility to know what is stored and how to delete, when to delete stuff. Okay, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hi, Philippe. Uh, first of all, thanks for your great talk. Thank you. Um, if I decide to make uh, JavaScript a mo mobile app, uh, what should I choose? Uh, this new service, Rockers, or maybe Cordova, Ionic, uh, React Native? Can, could you tell some pros and cons? Uh, about th those other tools that they are like the hybrid to, to make your app hybrid? Mm, to make uh, maybe some cross-platform. Yeah. yeah, progressive web apps, uh, the idea of the service worker is to make it be all fully cross engine, okay, so it's going to work. The only one that was not accepting that yet was Apple, and they are already working on that, so it's pretty soon going to be like in any platform. And yes, those tools are very powerful too, like you can run your web page in a different app and, uh, and make it native, kind of. But I see those, uh, is they are going to stay here for a while because uh, of the stores. Like if you want to sell your app on a marketplace, then you have to embed it somehow and publish that, okay? So for now, at least, you need that to do this, for now. Uh, I think pretty soon, as soon as you start, we start using more, building more progressive web apps, they are going to accept us to submit progressive web apps into the stores and marketplaces. But for now, you need those tools to add that, to, to create a package and publish there, okay? But the idea is that, uh, I think even that the idea of those tools were to be uh, temporary. I don't think they were here to, like, forever. They knew that sometime something like that would happen. So they are very powerful and very useful for this uh, feature you need. But if you just use the user to be able to install it and use it, then you can use a progressive web app as this and the service workers and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for questions more? Yep, one more question. Oh, they are right. <laughs> I'm excused for my maybe a bad oh. English, but I'll try. Yeah? Um, can I use any input fields in notifications? Or it's uh, not a good idea and it's useless? Good question too. The notifications API was very simple as it was born. The example I showed here is very simple. Like you can show a notification with an image, title, and text. But it has grown a lot. So the new updates on that API in the notifications API is full of new examples and you can, can even add buttons there, like a button for like buy or read more. And you can have many different fields like a bigger image. And it's very nice. There are many discussions on that too. And I think even Chrome that has already shipped something to support like the bigger image and the buttons, I think Chrome is already supporting that. And okay. uh, this API is growing a lot, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
I also have two T-shirts that huh? from Brazil. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. if you want to. Okay. Uh, can you choose three questions that we will present some basic stuff, some gifts for them? Just uh, three people. Three people? Oh my! Yeah. Um, how so many please questions? Stand up, everybody who already asked the question. How many questions we had? Five? No. Well, we had six. I have two T-shirts there, so we can give like to most Whoa, of them. Cool. Yeah. So yep. we, yeah, we have gifts for almost all of them. Only one is going to be out. <laughs> how to how to pick this up? Let's talk later. Then you can do that. Yeah. Le can we talk later and decide that? Maybe I, I may find another T-shirt to give to. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so everybody. Then we have like all the six gifts. Okay. I think we can do it uh, in the coffee break, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Philippe, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Uh, it's you. your gift uh, for the first Voronish. From the first Voronish, yes. Uh, please come to another uh, our events uh, and yes. enjoy Russia. <laughs> and thank Voronish, you very much. of course. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.